Oh, yeah. It's great. All right. And, uh, howdy, howdy, <laughs> folks. And we just come up right here with the pants down. The Harry's went and seen the, the new Elvis movie out about the young Elvis and the story about Elvis. And here we are talking about that as we're going live. So, people, we do here at uh, here in the Ozarks, we do talk about other things besides Bible that is here on the YouTube. Uh, so, I guess we do have a little bit of a life uh, outside of all that. A uh, couple of discussions. Uh, we will be back on uh, three days uh, as it pertains uh, to Israel. And uh, as they say, because of all this, because God changed the method of salvation when he called Saul, as we've gone through all of these things right here, is that really an accurate description of what went on in Acts 9? I had Acts 9 on here last week. We will read it that today, and because we're going into, as I said, the three days again. And the purpose of, of the three days, what is it for? Do you find that in Ephesians and do you find that in Colossians? If you do not, why do you not? On a couple of topics uh, I've read, uh, try not to post anything or intervene uh, in these conversations. I was just reading one uh, that's going back and forth. Uh, I did post on one and he said uh, uh, the revelation of the mystery, uh, the gospel of Christ that uh, is uh, in Romans 116 is it was a mystery. Well, folks, if it's a mystery, we have to define what that gospel of Christ is, number one. And in doing so, if the gospel of Christ, which Paul does use in Galatians 1, is pertaining to Acts 13, what is that gospel of Christ? Is that a mystery? If, and we will look at that, Acts 28, where Paul says... He's teaching and preaching everything out of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the psalmists. Now, how is that a mystery? And what is that revelation of the mystery? You can't get that through some people. They don't want to believe what their Bible says. I had another discussion with a gentleman this week, and we are going to talk about those. Uh, it is in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 11. And in Galatians, where uh, they want to sit there and say, well, they want to talk about people being a pervert and perverting the gospel, but they don't know what that gospel is that they're even perverting. Galatians is about going back under the law. Circumcision has nothing to do with Peter, has nothing to do with Paul. It's about these Jews wanting to go, go back under the law and circumcising anybody that's had to be saved. Look in Acts 15. You can see what that is. Anyway, folks, let's go ahead and start. And this is going to be one that is, um, I've had to update um, some of my thoughts on what we're going to talk about tonight. And nothing that I said before has changed. Only thing I'm just adding to. Okay, as I study more, I have to add on to uh, what I learn in Scripture. So we're going to be talking about those things. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, it is commonly called the resurrection chapter for a reason, because Paul speaks of resurrection, the whole chapter. And we're going to look at some verses in there, because if it's a mystery, folks, and if I find these verses that Paul references in Isaiah, what is the mystery? Is it that they just didn't understand what was being written? It could be so. They didn't. Their eyes were not enlightened to what Scripture is. 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at it. And verses 3 and 4. Let's go ahead and start with one. Because these are very popular verses, folks. Uh, and... Uh, certain circles that I used to chase my tail in certain circles. And moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein you stand. By what you are also saved, if, is that if a conditional if? If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye, all the people in 1 Corinthians 1 chapter, one verse one and two. 
unless you believe the vein. For I delivered unto you first. Paul did deliver to these people first. He was the first one there with this message. All of that which I also received. By it, which is a revelation. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, folks, how can you in this verse 3, in good conscience, sit there and say, if it says according to the scriptures, in accordance with which scriptures? Genesis through Malachi. Does it say mystery or it's in accordance with those scriptures? Verse 4. And then he was buried. And then he rose again the third day. Oh, the third day. Three days right here, Paul was blinded. The third day for national Israel. What does that mean? According to the scriptures. Is Paul lying or is this a mystery? If this is a mystery, that Christ rose the third day. He was buried. He rose the third day. If that's a mystery... What's going on back here? Let's look at it. Matthew 20, what Christ says. Oh, we can't come back here because that's not your mail. So they say, Matthew 20, verse 19. I'll get out of Mark. I have uh, only one paper Bible today. Matthew 20. So they are going faster because they are electronic. 2019. Now, folks, these are uh, the words of Christ right here. In his earthly ministry, when he's walking those dusty roads out there, in his earthly ministry, three, three and a half years. Is this a mystery? Let's we'll start in verse 18. Now, let's start in 17 to pick up the context. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem. Remember, up to Jerusalem. you got to go up that mountain to get to Jerusalem. Took the 12 disciples. Well, who are those 12? Well, you can find that out in Matthew 10, 5, who those 12 apostles are. Apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and to the, unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the Third day, he shall rise again. Now, isn't that exactly, with a couple of different changes in words, the same thing that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. The third day. How is that a mystery? According to the scriptures. We looked at Luke 24 last week. Let's go ahead and look at it again. Luke 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 24, verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he, Christ, to those twelve, at this time it's eleven, their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written. Paul says it's according to the scriptures, Christ raising from the dead. Christ in Matthew 20, 19 said, the third day I'll rise. Then he says right here in Luke, thus it is written. And thus is behoove Christ to suffer and rise the third day. Folks, how is that a mystery? When it's written right here in your Bible, written in the scriptures. First Corinthians 11. Now, I'm going to go ahead, while everybody's going to First Corinthians 11, I'm going to go back and read something real quick. First Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you gospel, which I preach, which also ye receive wherein you stand. In verse 2, he says this to him. Nope. In verse 3, I'm going to verse 3, sorry. For I delivered unto you first all that which I received. Paul received something in 1 Corinthians 15. 
1 Corinthians 11. Let's look at some wording here. If you're going to sit here and take 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and you're only going to paste that in memes, and you're going to do this, and that's by revelation, folks. If this is a mystery, then heed Paul's words here. 11, 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. Is that not the same thing as what he just said in 1 first, first Corinthians 15, 3? Just a little different word. It's the same thing. He received something. He delivered it to you, the Corinthians, the church of God, all the saints called to be saints, all those that call upon the name of the Lord. But what did he receive right here? If you're going to say, go around all the saying the same thing here, you've got to also take this right here in account, folks. And, and then if you'll be an honest Bible student, what is he speaking of right here? Well, you're going to have up there in the cornfields of Indiana, they're going to have uh, just going having some supper, having a jolly good old time, picking and a grinning. But this is not what that says, folks. There is a feast going on right here. And Christ gave it to Paul. It's in Christ's words right here also. By revelation. And it's the Passover. We're speaking of right here, folks. The third day in Israel is restoration for that nation. Saul's conversion is identified with Israel's rest restoration. The third day is about Israel. How, if that's the case, how could Saul, God, change something, the method of salvation at that time? If we're in preserving and the restoration of Israel, do you think, honestly, when Christ knocked him, if you can find a verse for us, I would really love to have it. That when Christ knocked Paul down, blinded him for three days, that he said, wipe from his memory about any feasts. Keeping any feasts. Well, you can't do that. Why? Because all throughout the book of Acts, Paul is always saying, I need to get to Jerusalem to keep this feast, keep Pentecost that feast. I got to get to Jerusalem to keep that feast and this feast and that feast. I got to. He's over in Corinth and he's got to travel a thousand miles just to get to Jerusalem to keep the feast. What changed? First Corinthians 11 right here. I'm not going to go into it. You can do it yourself. It's about the Passover. Christ is speaking about it right there. And you're a part of that bread if you take of that, of these people back here in Paul's Acts ministry. Then, because what is it? Passover. What did it represent? Where did Passover start? Back in Exodus, at the Exodus. It's national Israel's deliverance. Passover. Take that blood of that lamb, put it on the doorpost, and that it will pass over. Death will pass over. We're going back into Exodus here in a minute. But you have a feast right here, and he tells you if you'll keep that. Then, we're going to get into it tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Paul's talking about the Feast of First Fruits. But there will be some tell you, well, no, I'm the first trusted. They also probably tell you, well, I'm the, of that First Fruits. Paul was on schedule taking what Christ brought out to him, revealing what that Passover meant, and revealing to him in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, what that chapter means. There's a trumpet going to blow back there, folks, as in 1 Thessalonians 4. What is that called? The Feast of Trumpets. You had Passover. You had un the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you had, after that, 50 days, seven Sabbaths, to the day of Pentecost, where Peter was preaching in Acts 2. What was the next scheduled feast is called the Feast of Trumpets. And if you want to know what that is, go through 1 Corinthians 15, go through 1 Thessalonians 4, and you can find out about, now Paul doesn't call them as he did back then, as Moses did, 
But that's what's going on. There's no trumpet for you. There's no light from heaven, voice from heaven. You're not blinded. You're not told what to do. But somehow, with all of this, there is a change. So there's a feast going on right here. We have the Feast of First Fruits in 1 Corinthians 15. We have the Feast of Trumpets where Christ and that archangel are going to blow that trump and Christ was going to come and pick up his saints. The dead ones first, they're going to rise. And then when Paul says, we which are alive and remain. Folks don't want to hear that. I've been reading it all week. Oh, how God wins, they say. Roe v. Wade. Well, I find it interesting. If you get back in that Old Testament right there, there was a lot of people that God was not concerned about. Let's take King Saul. When that prophet Samuel walked in, Samuel walks in, he sees these sheep, he sees these goats, he sees these lambs, and he sees some women and children out there that's locked up. When he walks in there and sees Saul, there's an Amalite king right there on his knees bound. And Saul says, we're negotiating. What happened? Saul, or not Saul, Samuel takes Saul's sword and cuts his head off. The Amalite king. God told Saul through the prophet, you kill the king all the way down. If they carry cockroaches as pets, kill them all. And that included the children. None of them were to survive. So you think God really went in by Roe v. Wade? You think that's in his plans? If that was the case, why did it take 50 years for God to finally do something if God wins? It's a constitutional issue, folks. We're not here to talk about that. It's still a state issue. That's all I got to say about that one. Anyway, Acts 28, 16. Now, folks, and I know they have a hard time with this. Why, I don't know. And... I didn't have anybody to point this out to me when I was chasing my tail in certain circles. I had to figure this stuff out myself. But I have to believe the pages or the words that's on this page. Paul is at the end of his Acts ministry. You know how I know it's at the end? Because it's fixing to run out right here at the end of Acts 28. There is a dispensational change. God is now done dealing with this generation. And in verse 16, Paul gets, and here he is. And when we came to Rome, Paul has now made his way from Acts 21. Now he's made it in Acts 28. He finally arrives. Remember in King Agrippa in Acts 26, he is now going to be seen by Caesar. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered a prisoner to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days. Now, what do you reckon, folks, that after three days, Paul arrives in Rome. And three days later, something happens. I wonder what happened three days later. Something happened when Christ rose from that grave. Something happened. What do you think that was? And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, folks, we can go back to Acts 13. Paul starts out, men and brethren, stock of Israel, and all you that fear God, those Greeks provoking the Jews. Though I have committed nothing against the people, what are the people? Israel, the Jew, or customs, 
Here we are getting talking about those feasts right here, folks, or customs of our fathers. You think that includes the Levitical law? That law given in Exodus? Yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, the Romans, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. How could he do that? Paul, or Saul Tarsus, was a Roman citizen. Not that I ought to accuse my nation of, for this cause, therefore, what we just read, have I called for you to see you, those chief of Jews, and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Now we're on this hope of Israel here, folks. Let's flip over a few pages to Ephesians. Paul is bound with a chain right here, folks, for the hope of Israel. It does not say, and as he said in Acts 13, 23, that that Savior is for Israel and you God-fearing Gentiles. That Savior is for you. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Not to these people I'm fixing to talk about right here in Ephesians 3. A different bound, a different chain. 3 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say a prisoner for Jesus Christ or in Jesus Christ. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Why? If he was not a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he would not have been able to write these Ephesians and the Colossian letters because the Jews, as he said back there, would have taken his life. God spared this man so he can get you, you some information. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. It doesn't say anything about here about I'm bound now for you, Israel. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you word, no longer Israel word, Back to Acts. Verse 21. And they said unto him, We neither, those chief of Jews, we haven't received any letters from uh, Judea. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, thee, Paul. Neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. So why are you here, Paul? Because he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ on several accounts. This one's for the hope of Israel. 22. That we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. Are you really serious? Don't ask for anything you don't want. You want to know why? You might just get it. And I'm sure Paul laid it out there. He says it right here. We're going to sit, look at that. That we desire to hear of you what thou thinkest. For us concerning this sect, what sect? Paul's entire Acts ministry. These things that Christ revealed to him, which is according to scriptures. For us concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Of course it is. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. Now look where Paul is persuading these Jews from, folks. Concerning uh, Persuading them concerning Jesus. Because they did not believe that he was the Messiah, the Christ. Both out of the law of Moses, out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Yet, a man acts dispensations will sit there and say, that is a mystery back there. Luke wrote this. We cannot follow this because Paul didn't say it. Paul said it. Luke recorded it. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. 
Now, this is um, a mystery. There is a mystery in verse 51. We're going to probably start in 51. And the only mystery here is, is that it's not just going to be a resurrection of the dead. There's going to be some living people who go up in this resurrection. But the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, Paul includes himself in that we, which are alive and remain, will go with him in the clouds. At that trump, 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or be dead, and we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Go to First Corinthians or First Thessalonians four, and you can see that last trump. A shout from the Lord, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Nope, back to 51. But I show you a mystery. We should all sleep. We should all be changed. In a moment and twinkling an eye, the last trump, yes, for the for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, folks, there's something going on right here in the next couple of verses. Let's look at it. 53, for this corruptible must be put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54, folks, if this is a mystery, I should not be able to find that. In Isaiah, but we're going to find it. We're going to, I'm a hound dog out here, folks, with these scriptures. We're going to root it out like a hog roots up a fence. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal should have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Well, wait a minute, folks. This shouldn't be hard to isolate right here because Paul even says, right, thus it is written. Well, where is it written at? If it's written down somewhere, how can that be a mystery? Well, let's go find that. Isaiah 25, verse 8. I'm doing the hard work for you, folks. Isaiah 25. Remember, folks. While you're looking that up, I'm going to go back here to read in the beginning of Isaiah. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, is which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. If that's the case, Judah and Jerusalem, who is Paul bound in a chain for the hope of in Acts 28? 25 verse 8. See if this sounds familiar. He will swallow up death in victory. Oh, there it is written. And the Lord God will wipe away, wipe away fears from all the faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Folks, the Lord spoke through Isaiah. Isaiah wrote that down. Paul takes you or his readers back to and the churches he was going to in his Acts ministry back to Isaiah. Why would he take you back to Isaiah? Well, let's go up in Romans and see exactly why to the Romans and these folks in uh, at Paul's Acts ministry, why he could take you to that they've read this Isaiah since Isaiah wrote it down. Romans 15, verse 4, 4 or 8. We'll find it. I think it's four. There we go. It is four. Let's we'll start in verse three. There's another, as it is written, which we will be getting into uh, very soon. Not Paul's use of Isaiah. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written. So that's got to be somewhere back there. The reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Psalm 69, if you want to know. For whatsoever things were written afore, do you think those things that Paul was talking about aforetime would be Genesis through Malachi? Do you think the book of Isaiah and Isaiah 25, 8 fits into that? And for what purpose is he telling these Romans this for? was written for our learning, not your learning. 
that we, Paul, and this Roman church, which is filled full of Jews in that synagogue, and God-fearing Gentiles, which he calls Greeks in Romans 1.16, for you, that we, through patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. What is their hope? Resurrection hope. Their hope is that there's a trunk going to blow. Paul received from the Lord, and I delivered unto you in 1 Corinthians 11, how the Passover, it's the same, national Israel. And what was that for? A deliverance out of Egypt. The, the Feast of Unleavened Bread back in uh, Exodus, what was that for? Separation. We're going to look at those verses. And Pentecost, what was that? That was an arrival at Mount Sinai. What was fixing to happen then? There was a covenant fixing to be given to those people. And there's no difference in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 15. It's all coming to pass. First Corinthians 15, 55. First Corinthians 15, 55. Remember, there's a mystery in 51. Just because Paul uses the word mystery, we need to find out what he's talking about. And the only thing here is that if I'm alive, Paul says, I get to go with the dead in the resurrection. Of course, right after them, that was never before spoken. 55. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Well, that's got to be written somewhere. The next verse, the sting of death is in sin, and the strength of sin is law. Folks, you want to know what sin is, and the strength of sin? Try keeping those Ten Commandments, and you'll find out real fast that you can't keep one of them every day. You can try as hard as you want to. The harder you try, Paul says, the strength of that sin is the law. And they had 613 points of the law, folks, they had to keep. Pick up a stick on the Sabbath and see what you got. You had your brain smashed in. Let's go back here and find that. I should not be able to find this anywhere if it's a mystery. But let's go find Hosea. He's back here somewhere. It might be written down. I don't know. We got some Joes. We got some Amoses. We got some Hoseas. Then we're going to uh, 13, 14. Sorrows of a travailing woman should come upon him. He is an unwise son, and this is not the right verse. It's not the right one. But we do do those things here. So what we are going to do is go to Hosea 6.1. I did not get that last week because I only got down to here, and I didn't finish this right here because Hosea, if you go to Hosea, Peter says, and this is how they try to, Force what Peter was saying, where he says to the Lord, a thousand years is just like a day. Well, when there is no time, you created time. You created everything. Of course, a thousand years to you is just like a day. It, there's no time. That's what Peter was trying to get across. Hosea 6.1 you're going to find some words right here, folks. When I would have healed Israel. Now, as plain as I can read, it says, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered and the wickedness of Samaria, which is the northern ten tribes. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. You can go back and find that right after Solomon. For they commit falsehood, and a thief coming in, and a troop of robbers spoiled without. 
Well, I need to get into six one. Harry is probably looking at me right there. He's looking at me, but he didn't say anything. I was in seven one. Oh, I, I just looked up and Harry's looking at me and I'm starting to read. It's not saying what I want to say. Six one. But anyway, we know where Samaria is now. Come and let us return unto the Lord. We went up, we talked about some returning to the Lord about a month ago, five weeks ago, something like that. Who had to return to the Lord? For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, will he revive us. And the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, folks, three days in Israel, you had Jonah in the belly of the whale for three days. Christ even spoke about that in his uh, earthly ministry. How, oh, I'll destroy this temple just like the prophet Jonah. I'll be in that belly of that whale, of that earth for three days and three nights. And then I will rise up. He spoke about it. It's not a mystery. Three days. What happened on that third day when he sat there and says, he will raise us up. Exodus 10. We're going back here to the beginning. Oh, the nation of Israel, anyway. They become a nation in Exodus 19. But anyway, right here in Exodus 10, 11, and 12, they're still in Egypt. Verse 22, 10, 22, I want to make sure I'm in the right chapter. Here's a 10, then I get down to 22. And Moses stretched forth his hand. Moses did a lot of stretching of that hand and that rod. Toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Folks, do you think when Christ was in that belly of that earth for three days and Jonah was in the belly of that whale for three days, dead, that there was a thick darkness? Three days. Paul was blinded three days. Verse 23. They saw not one another. Who's that? The Egyptians. Why? Because I don't know how dark a thick darkness is, folks. But they couldn't even see each other. So it had to be darker than a dark. It's a thick one. And they saw not one another. Neither rose any from his place for another three days. But all, listen to this, folks. What's going on right here with the nation with this children of Israel? Read it. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now, you tell me how that works, folks. Not one Egyptian could see the other Egyptian in his own house, no matter what. But those Israelites, they could see each other. They had a, a light. Where, where do you think that light is? Do you think it's that same light from heaven that blinded Saul on that road to Damascus? That same light in creation in Genesis 1, the three days that's back there. Chapter 12, verse 17. Moses is telling these Israelites what God told him to tell them. If you folks want to leave this land, if you don't want to make bricks no more without hay, as because of the Pharaoh hardened his heart and God hardened his heart, you better listen to Moses. And ye, Israelites, shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread. You can't eat a piece of bread that has yeast in it, folks. You got to eat basically a cracker for seven days. For in this self same day have I brought you armies 
your armies out of the land. Feast of unleavened bread. What is that? Out of the land. Your armies out of the land. Separation from Egypt in back here. And the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Trumpets that Christ revealed those. Paul goes all the way back to here. They did not know what that meant back here, folks. It was all Christ-centered. But they did not know what that was until he himself enlightened the eyes of those 12. He himself enlightened the eyes and revealed that to the Apostle Paul. Verse 17, I'm still at 17. For in this same self day I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. The, Moses is calling this feast an ordinance. Well, I've had to update. Let's go to, uh, back now why this is on my mind. Uh, he calls it an ordinance Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. He's calling these feast folks ordinances. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I have received this ordinance, and I'm fixing to tell you about. And the purpose of this ordinance Just like I received, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, about the last trump that's fixing the blow right here, folks. That was their expectation. We're going to do the Passover. We're going to do the unleavened bread. We just went through the Pentecost and the next on slate. Woohoo! We're out of here, folks. They were out of here. It wasn't pertaining to us. We're not under no feast because we're fixing to go as why we're not under that here in a second. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he took, that night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Paul says, then if you take it down through here, you're part of that bread. It's not a get-together up in the cornfields, just to say howdy. Now, let's go over to Colossians. We got some updated information here, folks. Remember, these are some ordinances. I have to add because I've always taught, which I was not incorrect on that, but there was other ordinances that Paul says, I delivered unto you. And I'm updating my software here today to you, which I received. I delivered to you, as Paul says, see? He received an ordinance. He sat there and said that in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. Colossians 2, uh, 14. This one, this new man that is created back here. And when we do the, our, our, our Ephesians and Colossians, um, you never know when I might. I just might pop that in any time. I don't know. Uh, maybe soon, may not be very soon. If it does, I'll update that info too. But uh, 2, 14. Remember, Paul is given a feast. It's called Passover in 1 Corinthians 11. He received that from the risen Lord, and he delivered that to you as he did the Feast of Trumpets, which was fixed and that's on tap in uh, chapter 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. What ordinance do you think that is, folks? Do you think that these Gentiles, the faithful in Christ in Ephesians and Colossians, are having to do those ordinances now? They're blotted out. Though these people did not know that at the time that Christ died, it was a due time. That was contrary against us. Now, who's the us? Who is under those ordinances? Here another is a pronoun, folks, that you need to grasp a hold of to understand Ephesians and Colossians. Paul's entire Acts ministry was those us's and those we's who first trusted. It wasn't the faithful in Christ. They were never under those. Why? They were at the temple of Artemis worshiping Princess Diana. 
They cared nothing about the God of Abraham. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, when Paul was exercising all this stuff back here, folks, in 1 Corinthians, he got a revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ about the Passover meal and off to uh, the Trumps in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Later, Paul gets a new revelation here, folks, for you Gentiles and who the faithful in Christ and to those saints. And But the us here, folks, is blotting out those ordinances. We no longer have to do the Passover, the Feast of Trumpets. We don't have to go down to Jerusalem anymore to Pentecost. Let's get back to Exodus. Exodus uh, 10, 21. You cannot understand, folks, what Paul is teaching and preaching in the Acts ministry. Unless you go, like Christ said, unless you go what Paul says, I was preaching out of the law of Moses, out of the prophets and the psalmists from morning to night. Until you get back here and you dig back here, folks, you can understand what Paul is preaching. You really need to try to focus and, and to understand your Bible. It's get a Jew mentality of what was going on back here. And you will never be able to grasp that because you can't. You're not living in that society. But you can try. I'm trying. 12, 21. Then Moses called for all the other elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out you a lamb according to your families and kill that Passover. Folks, when you see that Lord's Supper on that picture hanging on the wall, you'll see some apostles at that table. Who was that lamb that was going to be killed on Passover? He was sitting there. You have seen him. His name is Jesus, and he is the Christ, that Messiah, that Paul in Acts 9. Let's go ahead and go ahead and read that right now. Acts 9. Because we have it on the board, and we need to read that. Acts 9. We're going to start in verse 20. Then we're going to read, go back into Acts 9 a little further. Acts 9, 20. And straightway, after straightway what? After Paul was strengthened with some meat, after his eyes were opened, after Ananias laid hands on that man, after Ananias baptized him, after Ananias went back to Isaiah and said, Wash away thy evil deeds. 116, I believe. 920. But straightway, he preached Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah in Hebrew, <clears throat> in the synagogues. Why well, I thought, folks, that because God changed the method of salvation when he called Saul, something new changed. There's a mystery here. That's the news that's going around for almost 100 years or so. That he is the son of God. Oh, let's start back in verse 4 now. Now we're starting 3. And as he journeyed, so, journeyed Saul, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why prosecuteth me? He did not say right here, Saul, Saul, why blasphemeth the Holy Ghost? And he said unto him, well, who art thou? Folks, I'm going to tell you what. I can guarantee you this right now. If I'm knocked off my horse and I'm blinded and I hear a voice, I'm going to say, who art thou too? And I might have the same response as what Saul said right here. I am Jesus, who thou persecutest. It's hard for to kick against bricks. I might be trembling myself, folks, if I can't see after I see that light. And as John said, Lord, well, of course he would. What else would you say? 
You didn't feel anything knock you off that horse. You were just knocked off of it and blinded. What wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city and teach the dispensation of the grace of God that I'm going to, uh, in 30 years advance in the future, give you to speak to the Gentiles only. It doesn't say that, folks. Go into the city and it should be told you what you must do. Saul had no idea what he was going to do when he was led by the hand into Damascus to find that man Ananias on a street named Straight. He had no clue. All and the men was journey with him, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man, no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days. Now, why do you think he was three days? Why wasn't he two days blinded? Why wasn't he four days? Why not a week? Why not just Saul take a month off and just recoup a little bit, do a little resting, and get your life in order? Why three days? It is a restoration to the nation of Israel. Exodus 34, verse 22. And thou shalt. It doesn't say if you want to, if you don't want to, if you're just not feeling it. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks. Now, what is the Feast of Weeks, folks? You can't call it Pentecost because Pentecost is a Greek word that they could not translate into English. And it is an actual Greek word, just like your word pharmacy, pharmaceutical. You Unless you know something about Greek, you don't know how many words you use every day. There are actually Greek words. And the word for the Feast of Weeks, why is that? You have seven Sabbaths and one day makes 50. That's a Feast of Weeks, the Pentecost, of the first fruits. Wait a minute. Paul, in this verse right here, is talking about some first fruits, folks. Of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the wheat of the ingathering at the year's end. There was a feast back here, folks, that was going on. And they were chalking them off. Just like I've chalked my board off right here about the old Te the Saul's Old Testament conversion. That's exactly what the nation of Israel was doing after Christ rose from the dead. You had the Passover. The night that he was for his kill. You had the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Feast of First Fruits. First Fruits, Christ being the first one to raise from the dead. We're going to look at it in a minute. And then the next on tap, you had Pentecost, which is a week of feast. Have it Acts 2. The next one on slate was that trumpet. First Corinthians, let's look at that first fruits. First Corinthians 15. There's a mystery here, folks. 15. Now, we have to ignore verse 11 because we can't explain it if you're in a denomination. Let's go ahead and read that. Verse 11. Therefore, whether it were I, Paul, or they. Now, who are the they's we went through this. We're going to do it again. Who are the days that Paul mentions in this chapter? Well, there's a Peter and the boys up here. And there's about 500 folks that seen Christ after his resurrection. Paul mentions those people here. He does. And verse 6, after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom a greater part remain unto this present. But some are falling asleep. They're dead. And, but the verse four, and he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. And then when you come down here, verse eleven, they don't believe that verse. I have to believe it because that's what it says. It's simple to understand if you just believe it. Whether it was I or they, Paul speaks of the they up here. 
So we preach. We and these people up here, we preach this. And so ye believed. If Peter came over here, one of the folks from the 500 over here, preaching what that man Paul taught back here, you believed it. But only kingdom saints, right? And then we got a little flockers. We got the kingdoms. All these things that they create. I've got the word that we, uh, we're not going to, we might, no, we're not going to finish it, but that's okay. First Corinthians 15, 20 now. But now, Paul says, but here's a but now, at that time, is Christ risen from the dead? Which is true. Romans 10, 13. Confess with thy mouth, Jesus Christ, and believe that he rose from the dead. And thou shalt be saved, Paul says in Romans. But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits. He was the first, and you can't claim this first, folks. Like you can't claim the first, who, we who first trusted in Ephesians 1.12. Of them that slept. For since by man came death, Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ, we went through that in Christ, folks, a few weeks ago, shall all be made alive. Verse 23. But every man in his own order. Those folks then in uh, verse 6 of this chapter right here, the ones that are already dead out of the 500, they're right after Christ rising at a time. Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Of course, there's a big debate about when his coming is. He told you exactly when his coming is going to be. And we it's a future study we will get into. And uh, it is a difference whether it's a demonstrative, demonstrative pronoun, this or that. You got to believe, is it this one or that one? Is it this hand or is it this hand? Now, there's an old saying from Arkansas you do this in this hand, and you do that in that hand, and you see which one fills up faster. We won't go into that today, but anyway, uh, let's go to Levit Levit Leviticus. Easy for me to say, right? Seven, and then we're going to wrap this thing up for today. Three days. We'll probably do one more on uh, three days. There's a, uh, more info back here on three days, folks, and I can shake most of this staff at. It's filled back there. If you dig around back there and find it, and to whom it pertained to, Leviticus chapter 7, verse 17 and 18. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice... On the third day shall be burnt with fire. Now, folks, do you think, uh, what do they call this back here? The Levitical law. And to whom do you think that pertained to? The nation of Israel? Verse 18. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering be eaten at all on the third day, it should not be accepted. Don't accept, don't even eat it on that day because it won't be accepted in that offering. Neither shall be imputed unto him that offended it, offered it. It shall be an abomination. Now, listen here, folks. <clears throat> this last sentence right here if they ate that on that third day, it won't be counted to that offering. And look at this. And the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. Now, in another verse, it says, That soul, that soul shall be cut off. And we'll probably look at that next week. Who is cut off or who could be cut off in Romans 11? Those Gentiles. Oh, my goodness. But they cannot in all their wisdom, man's wisdom that they think they have, they think they rightly divide. And all they do is confuse people, folks. Why? 
because they cannot understand. Well, that cannot be the body of Christ. Well, you're absolutely right, folks. In Romans, that was not the body of Christ, or they could not be cut off. Those Gentiles, in verse 11, 13, Paul speaking of, apostle of the Gentiles, could be cut off in Romans 11. They were grafted into that vine of Israel. And as we always say here, the mud clears when you rightly divide the word of truth.